we are on air. <laughs> okay, so okay. this is a little trip report for uh, iClear 2020. Okay, so this is a little trip report for iClear. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the conference first. So these are some of the pictures I took in the conference was in Ethiopia. Uh, I'm just joking, but that's, uh, that's actually how it was. And so it was fully online, it was supposed to be in Ethiopia, which is a really nice move from the organizers uh, due to the recent visa issues we had. So a lot of uh, researchers from Africa, they, were, they couldn't get into iClear or New Rift because of visa. So they decided to move the conference there, which is nice. But it was online anyway. Uh, but we had 89 countries. You can see in this small uh, picture over here, 80, 89 countries, 1,400 speakers, a lot of chat methods and video watches. So I, I didn't watch the conference uh, live. So that week we were quite busy. We had a uh, milestone going. So I just, I just catch it a week after. So mainly what I watched was I went through the papers. And then I watched the video for the papers and I, I read the reviews and uh, I took a little look at the papers. Um, my general feedback is that it's not the same as going to a conference, uh, mainly because in the, when you are in the conference, I mean, it's, it's very tiring. You, you get there eight o'clock in the morning. We just watch presentation after, after presentation all day long. And then at night you go to posters, but it's just, you are there, you are, there in that environment and you just don't want to stop you know like seeing things and you're just motivated to do that so i could do that for an entire month but when you're doing this at home it's it's very much different so after two three hours it just gets very boring very tiring so it's it's definitely not the same experience so when you're watching live like i did with neuromatch it was a little bit better so if you're going for a conference online i'd recommend you watching it live but when you're not watching live and then you can stop and then you can do whatever it's uh, I wasn't very motivated to do so like I had more stuff going on and I, I'd rather code than watch uh, the lectures can you hear me well okay do, if you're not just let me know because I usually have issues with my connection yeah so far I've, I've been hearing you well okay me too sounds so, great okay so they did this little map, which I think it's very nice, uh, like this uh, grouping uh, by topics, like clustering by topics. And they had search capabilities. So you could search by keyword, by author. Every paper had this small video. And my feedback here is that the videos were usually very small. So even the, the main talks, they were only like six, seven minutes. Uh, there was not a lot of information in it. And, I was getting a lot more information from the review, from the discussions in the review, than I was getting from the presentations. And yeah, and the reviews are also, they're interesting to see. I mean, they can be very brutal at some point. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was an interesting experience. So I, I, I have three topics. One, it's uh, neuroscience. It's not a lot of neuroscience, just whatever it was there. And then deep learning theory and pruning and sparsity. There are a bunch of other stuff I'd love to talk about that I thought they were really cool, but I don't think they really fit what we're doing uh, now at Nomenta. And I didn't want to make this into a very long presentation. So on neuroscience, there was the, this one day workshop on bridging AI and cognitive science, not exactly neuroscience. And there are also a few papers in the overall conference, but it was not a lot. It was a lot less than uh, NeurIP. So you could see NeurIP, especially last year, had a bigger focus on neuroscience. So in this workshop, uh, the main topics that were being addressed was uh, concept learning, causal reasoning, language acquisition, and learning from field data, which are uh, general topics from cognitive science. And they had these open questions, which were the questions that the papers were supposed to answer, uh, which inductive bias do we uh, humans or animals use to support rapid learning? How can we share concepts across multiple domains? Uh, how can we have models of the world that can be approximate and useful? How does uh, memory limitations facilitate learning? And how should we represent other people's goals and intentions? So these were uh, the main open questions in the field, I'd say. This was a nice workshop. It was long, like eight hours long. 
it, uh, I pick up a few papers from there that I thought it would interest you. So this one, it was, we reviewed last year that uh, the Carlo paper, and then there are several follow-ups where he uh, correlates uh, convolution neural network activations with neural activity. And this paper, it's kind of a continuation on that, but they went full scale. And so they compare neural, neural recordings with over 50 different architectures. So they got everything which was there in a PyTorch model zoo. Uh, they use a two photon calcium imaging data set from uh, 30,000 neurons in the mouse visual cortex. And instead of just doing regular object classification, they compare with 21 computer vision tests. So there's this larger data sets called test, test economy, and they compare it to all the tests there. So you can see the models here, hey, they are hey, Lucas. How, what, can you remind me just what are they basically doing to make these comparisons? How, how they have this huge amount of uh, two photon calcium imaging and they got a network. What is the method that by the comparison making these comparisons? Yeah, they, they're looking for correlations between the, the, the activations in one network and the other network. Um, I don't that know the like, exact specific. It seems uh, like a but, very, it's like a very open ended idea, right? I mean, uh, it's not clear to me. Um, I don't know. I mean, it just, that seems almost like a, I, I, I guess I just don't understand it. It seems like a, uh, there's so many ways you could go about that. You know, what's the animal doing? What are the, you know, the, how, how are they characterizing the behaviors of a neuron? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's confusing to me. I mean, just, just making sure you get the basic paradigm. They show images to a mouse. Uh, they show those images to a neural network. They look if you can find mappings between the neurons of the neural network and the calcium imaging data of the mouse uh, showing the same images. Okay, so they're, they're literally showing like uh, the kind of image data that we work with all the time. And they just flash it in front of a mouse's retina. Is that what they're doing? Yes, I think that's the, correct. Okay, that's, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> so they don't train, there's no like a um, loss function on the, uh, <clears throat> on the neural networks to like, approximate the, the like real neurons or is it are they just running a bunch of them and seeing how close they come to <laughs> mouse cortex yeah they, they're not trying to specifically approximate the, the mouse uh, visual cortex they're just running the same task and comparing like market sets so so, so these are networks they did these that are neural bit. networks that were trained on ImageNet. so that was the last function i guess Right. Oh, so, so what are the what activations are they comparing are they just going through like all the layers and uh, so, I, I, uh, like, I, I, I know their, their previous study where they use primate data, I know it quite well. Uh, and what they, what they do is they look for linear mappings where they can say, like, this neuron in, uh, in primate v like V4 or IT can be we somewhat well approximated by taking a linear mapping of these five or six artificial neural network neurons oh, uh, and and they tr they search for these mappings and if they can find a linear mapping specifically if it's if it's linear then they 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 say that like that means that these neurons and this artificial layer are using a similar basis in a sense okay that they're okay. they're encoding the input in a similar basis Got it. so they're okay. trying to figure out sort of like what is the basis for it and v4 um and uh, for these static images, I think they're, they're, they're humble about the fact they know that they're doing static flashed images and that that's a limitation, but that's, that's the, kind of the general idea. Okay. We, we, don't, and, uh, even, we don't even know if uh, these are rodents, right? Um, so we don't even know if these images are even in any remote sense meaningful to the rodents, right? I mean, we know that the neural network can classify these things. We don't know that the rodent can do that either. I mean, that shouldn't, I don't know how relevant that is though. Like, well, if, if, if the rodent is totally incapable of the task that the network has been trained, the neural network has been trained to do, then you would expect that there'd be fewer correlations. <laughs> I mean, there's an assumption that the mouse's brain is doing the same thing as the neural network's brain. It's not, that's not clear to me, but all right. I, I, given all this, it's fine. Yeah, um, it's also, just, it's weird that they're doing it in mouse because mice also have a very flat hierarchy. There's hardly any hierarchy in the mouse. Yeah, it's, it's almost all V1, right? So yeah. it's almost and, anything else. So anyway, it's okay. V2 it's, when you stack it together. Yeah, a little bit more than, but not much. It's not like the, but the v, V2 is teeny. I mean, it's a very tiny region compared to V1. 
So that's and so it's it's not nothing at all like a primate's uh, visual. System. Is is this in? Are they recording only in V one, Lucas? Do you know? I I know. I don't know. That'd, that'd uh, be... We can. It, 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 it seems like it, it's, it's a very sort of a, a brute force approach, I guess, uh, but could be still be very interesting. So, yeah, I don't really see but, why they did. I mean, the, the reason for doing it in mouse would the, the easy reason is with calcium imaging, you can record a large number of neurons, and yeah. just the techniques there, they can, it's yeah. easier for them to do that. They do, yeah, they do it primarily like, in primates, but that, it's harder to get that data. Yeah, but that's like saying, I have a hammer, let me find a nail. You know, it's like, oh, I have a cool technique, you know, what can I do? Yeah, I, I, yeah but, it, you know, but Mark is right. If you want to do uh, primate studies, it's really, really difficult. I mean, it's just so many other layers of problems and issues and you have to find a lab yeah. to do that. So, yeah. That's you, true. But even doing this is a, you know, it's a pretty significant effort. And yeah. but I assume end, that, you know, I assume what do you each, expect to learn from it? You know? Yeah, I don't know. I, basically, they have labs who do a lot of two photon calcium imaging and, you know, and they could just say, hook up the hook up the mouse and <laughs> show these images. I, I get it. Okay, I get it. I get it. Isn't this problem kind of uh, degenerate? Like <clears throat> these these networks have like many. I don't know how many how many units do they have? Like many thousands, right? Um, these image net networks, and then like you can find several, especially if you're doing a linear company, you could find several different types of. Uh, Network uh, of combina linear com uh, linear combinations of units that would ex look like some unit randomly. I'm sure they do some statistics on that. I just like don't really don't really see why this is interesting. I I, yeah. I can I can give defenses for these things because I've talked about the previous work where they were really careful about that, where they were really careful about like having number of layers line up with specific layers and cortex. Uh, so there are answers to these questions. This is going to become a long discussion, though, if I keep it answer. If I okay, okay. So, yeah, I, I, mean, I think I in the in the context of primates, it makes a little more sense to me. It's just uh, you know even that I think is somewhat dubious, but at least it makes a little bit more sense in the mouse. It's like uh, <laughs> so just just get past that, and and um, I I need a, a refresher on the R squared value, the variance component, to know how significant these results are, what they found. I, I, when you go through that, Lucas, maybe you can just remind me what these yeah. mean. So, so just to answer uh, sub that question first, uh, that's so the paper says 65,000 neurons collected across the visual cortex of 221 awake adult mice, and the neuro sample includes six areas of visual cortex and four cortical layers. That, that's what it says on the paper. Um, four cortical layers. Oh, interesting. That would be like what one through four or something like that. Uh, oh, two, three, uh, they're, yeah, they're probably yeah. just not, they're just, they're doing surface, uh, optical imaging on the surface, like an article so deep. Yeah, there is no specific. So, so they can't, they can't reach the deeper layers because uh, the technique doesn't allow that. You can reach layer, it's very hard to reach layer six, but you can, you can reach layer five easily. Yeah, well, I, it sounds like they're not, they're not. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just commenting, <laughs> just, yeah. just FYI. It's harder, I, I understand it's harder, but, but maybe not. Okay. Okay, so uh, Jeff asked about the R2. So the R2 is just a measure of uh, how much of the variance can be explained, and that would go from uh, zero to one. And these values they seem very low to me, zero point one, zero point one five. So what can you just explain that in English? So when you have a point one variance, that means there's not a lot of correlation. Is that right? Um, there's yeah, not a lot, uh, not a lot of yeah. Generally, yeah. The, my understanding is point one. It's not. Uh, that's, what, that's what I was thinking. So, so we can argue all day long whether this is a good experimental setup, but if, if they don't find much here, then it doesn't really matter, right? It's kind of moot. Uh, it, it's still some. I mean, zero would be, there's doesn't explain anything. So if point one, it means there's still some correlation. I mean, generally machine learning, I would find point one to be a very low score, but maybe, I don't know, in these studies, they're considering point yeah. one to be a high score. So. I if don't you know look why. at the one on the right, it's uh, if I understand that correct, that's just a randomly initialized network. Yes, and, and I also I think they wanted to show there is a difference if you pre-train and if you randomly initialize, so it increases the variance a little bit. The, a little the bit. R2 a little bit. Did did they try? You said they did two hundred and twenty mice. Did they try yes. to relate uh, one mouse to a, uh, you know a bunch of mice to other mice? 
I'm just wondering what the <laughs> best you could get. You know, what is the best you can get? You know, neurons are very noisy. These things are very, uh, there's going to be a lot of variation between animals. And so what is kind of the best that you could do in some sense? Yeah. I don't know. The, the paper is very small. It's just like four pages before the reference. Uh, it's a workshop yeah. paper. So yeah. kind of all the information in the paper is the one we talk about here. So they might release something uh, bigger after, like a full conference paper or something like that. So the, this information's not there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think so. Mark, uh, Mark Alleg, I'll just send out a, a summary here if you just want to read. Yeah, that, that, that's cool. Yeah, I don't really I think they thing. make any like strong conclusions and they say clearly convolution and depth alone are not enough to sort of explain what they're trying to explain. So I'm going to say is that I, I think we sort of jumped the gun and just sort of assumed that they were going to sort of make some kind of conclusion saying that um, there would be a high correlation, but their sort of results are there isn't. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. The architecture doesn't explain it well enough. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Mark. I think yeah. we all were assuming that they're going to make some claim about this. So maybe I, this I, is. Yeah, I, I just find it really interesting that they would even spend the effort to do this. <laughs> 220 oh. mice. These experiments are not easy to do. Is it possible they already had this data somehow and, uh, and someone said, hey, we already have this data. Let's just crank it with a few lines of you know, code here and see what we get. Oh, well, that could be. That could I be. don't know. I'm just that, that would be more likely. I, that, that it is. I don't, I, they, they didn't collect just for this. They, had the, they used the Allen Brain Observatory Visual Coding oh, Dataset. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, so got they, it. They just use an available data set. But somebody had somebody had at some point say, "Hey, let's show all these all these mice, these you know these uh, these image data sets we use in machine learning," uh, which is an interesting question why they did that. But anyway, okay, I think so. So yes, yeah, so I think the conclusion here is there isn't a lot of correlation, and this technique <laughs> may not be very successful. Yeah. Uh, just FYI, so the R squared is the square root of the correlation coefficient, I think, which is easier for many people to. Imagine so, like a uh, R squared of 0.10 is about 0 0.3 correlation, which means if you plot the, you know, if you plot your variables x versus y, it will be like 0 0.3 slope, basically. Um, but I think it's easier for me to interpret it perhaps as this R squared. It's like okay, you go from zero to one, and 0 0.1 is not much. Right? Oh, just if you want to like visualize. Okay, for me it helps to like look at the correlation coefficient, but I guess it's different for different people. Well, presumably they did this R-squared thing because it's somehow uh, more relevant. Uh, I'm not sure when you use one versus the other. Okay. Okay, so I move on. I, I, I showed this because I thought it would be kind of interesting to discuss. And, uh... <laughs> it's, it's certainly generated a lot of discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think it is interesting to see what people are trying. You know, it, it gives you a sense of the state of thinking about these things. Uh, which is helpful to know. Oh God, you're not gonna like the next one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, tr we'll try to hold it. I'll try to hold my tongue. Let's see. No, no, go ahead. That's the goal. I, I haven't seen uh, it yet. So. <laughs> just, uh, just a, a, a quick reminder. Is, uh, um, so I haven't spent a lot of time on each of these papers. Like presentations, like five minutes, and then I skim the papers. So I, I might not know the answer to all the questions. So this paper is from the main conference, actually, not from the workshop. It's called Emergence of Functional and Structural Properties of the Head Direction System by Optimization of uh, Recurrent Neural Networks. And their point here is that you could use neural networks not just to model the neural activity in the brain, but you could also recover the neural activity and the uh, anatomical properties of neural circuits. And for this case, they're using the head direction system as an example. So that's the head direction system of a fruit fly. And they use RNNs to estimate the head direction through uh, integrating the angular velocity. And what they show is that they, some of the neurons would be, uh, co the, the activity of some of the neurons will be correlated to the activity of compass neurons and shifter neurons in the fruit fly. So what they're implying is that you could recover the same type of neurons in the recurrent neural network by training it as you would find in an actual uh, fruit fly. So that would be the main claim of the paper. Um, yeah. Awesome. So, so, you know, <laughs> look at, that seems to be less, less of a stretch than the previous one. So, um, okay. you know, this is a very simple network. It's not doing, you know, head direction cells. You're just trying to rec recreate a certain um, break point property that is actually might be implemented in a very few neurons in the brain. So, um, so 
just in case you thought we we're going to jump all over this one, I'm not. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay. I, I did think. Uh, I'm opening the presentation on another um, screen because I had notes and the notes are not showing Zoom. Okay, cool. So, uh, so this this paper is a big paper. Full results are there. So this other one was in the workshop. I really like it. Uh, just because I work on robotics a little bit in the past. So this was by uh, Leslie Peck Cobling from uh, MIT. She's a ro roboticist. And this was a, this was a very uh, open and frank discussion. And she, she approached the conference as a roboticist. Like, I don't know anything about neuroscience. I don't know anything about cognitive science. But uh, these are the things we've learned in robotics over the last 30 years. And that was, it was a really nice overall presentation. And these are the things that we as roboticists want to learn from cognitive scientists that can help us. So she talked, so I, I pick up some of the things from her slides. So she first differentiates between intelligent systems, embedded systems, and embodied systems out there to humans. So humans, it's like a small subset of all these larger uh, sets. And just, these are what she lists as the main um, mod modules we, we need in robots. Like we have to learn transition models, inference rules, and the search control. And the inference mechanisms we need are these in robotics in general, right? Um, I, I have a question before you go on to the next slide. So yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You can, so you can. In, in the little diagram, um, it's interesting that she puts, I think the she, right? Or is it a he? Well, it's it's she, she, yeah. Um, she. She, uh, she puts intelligent systems as sort of the outside of the box. It's like, it's the least common, it's, a, it's, it's you know, I, I'm not sure what, what intelligent systems are in that diagram if they're not embedded in bodies or animals. <laughs> it's like what, what qualifies as intelligence? You know, some people would say intelligence is sort of the peak of, of something, you know, peak of uh, cognitive ability. And, and this is sort of suggesting intelligence is sort of the, the opposite of that. Am I, am I interpreting that correctly? Uh, yeah, I also found it curious, but intelligent in this sense, it's, it can learn. Right. It, it, okay, it so it's a very simple, input and, it's a very simple yeah. idea. Uh, yeah, okay, you know, it's interesting because I'm dealing with this issue in, in the book and, um, you know, trying to define what intelligence is and there's, there's various people have different ideas about this and it's interesting to see this. This is sort of the, almost the opposite of, you know, what I would yeah, think but, what most people might think. I, I think you're going back, uh, going to what Lucas said, I think the way to maybe interpret it is the intelligent systems here might be sort of passive stuff that's just getting data in and processing it. That's the most general thing. And then embedded systems are maybe embedded in the environment and maybe getting streaming data coming no, in. I, I got the rest closer. of it. Yeah, and I got the rest of it. And then embodied is like there's actual movement involved. Yeah, it's, uh, just, interesting. it's just interesting that I think most lay people would not they could understand everything except maybe the intelligent part being outside of that. You know, it's like uh, just an interesting observation that um, I think it, it runs a bit counter to what the lay person thinks about what intelligence is. Well, if it's a Venn diagram, then that's a superset of everything. Yeah, but 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 most people, some people would assume that intelligence doesn't extend beyond animals. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, you know. Okay. Uh, anyway, okay. This is interesting. Right. So, so the, the kind of questions she had for uh, the cognitive science. So this is her workshop presentation. She had a larger presentation, the main conference, but this was supposed to be like a conversation. I mean, it didn't happen as it's supposed to happen because of uh, you no know, remote. But the question she, she asked was uh, what kind of knowledge are innate? So what sort of things we can assume and use as inductive biases in our models in robotics? Uh, what corners can we safely cut? I mean, what can we ignore? What we don't need to worry about? Uh, things we can learn from the brain, right? Uh, what kinds of uh, modularity we see in the brain that would be useful to replicate in, in robots? Uh, how do brains encode spatial information? That's the million dollar question that everyone is, is, is working on right now. And what are the multiple scales and mechanisms of learning that we have uh, in the brain? And how do we, what are the mechanisms that animals use to stop repeating the same unsuccessful actions? And how do we, how can we model uh, other agents? So all these questions are questions that we can learn from neuroscience that would help robotics. So the, are the questions that are being asked at the same time in, in this both uh, 
in these two disciplines. So uh, yeah, there is a huge gap right now between robotics and cognitive science. You could even say between robotics and uh, deep learning, and they're not the same field. And I've done robotics in the past, and it's very different from machine learning. But she's trying. She's trying to close the gap, right? She's. Look, she knows the same it, questions it, are being asked. Do you, where is that list of questions? Oh, um, uh, I didn't put in the slide. It's on my notes. Uh, maybe I can. I thought I could show my notes here somehow. Uh, or just, or just, um, I don't know. I can share it. Just share I, it on Slack or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. I'll share it in Slack. I put it in the chat anyway. But then I'll uh, share it. Uh, okay. More chat. But then I'll share it in Slack. Michelangelo, is that, right is that what you just sent out? Is that the list of questions? Oh, no, you just okay, there we go. That. I got it. I, oh, I got you it. send the slides. And it, it's I, said, I, got the, I got it from over there. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay, cool. So, so the, the whole point of the trip report is like showing these interesting papers, and then I put the link, and you, you can take a, a closer look there. Uh, so this last one, I'm not... I'm actually not going to talk about it. So I just thought it was interesting because, you know, you had that uh, Friston paper, I think 2009, maybe Eric can correct me, which is a reinforcement learning or active inference. And then a lot of people are working now on using active inference principles in reinforcement learning. So this is was, this paper was like based on that idea, but I really don't want to go down the active inference <laughs> road right now. It's going to be at least one hour discussion. Okay. So uh, deep learning theory, I pick up three papers, which I think are really nice. So one is, is also like huge uh, effort, like a huge work. It's called Fantastic Generalization Measures and Where to Find Them. It's a reference to the movie, Fantastic Beasts or something like that, like the Harry Potter movie. So what they did is they evaluated four, 40 different generalization measures over more than 2,000 models, simple models in two data sets. And the idea was to uncover uh, causal relationships between each generalization measure and uh, generalization per se. So they wanted to see which ones actually had some relationship with generalization. And they had some very interesting findings there. Uh, one of them, which was quite surprising, is that norm-based measures, they failed to correlate well with generalization. Some of them were even negatively correlated. And the reason why it's interesting is because we, uh, the way we force our networks to generalize is we use uh, L2 regularization, right? It's essentially a norm-based measure. And what they're showing is it's not actually a very good, it doesn't correlate well with generalization at all. So there, there's better things we, we should be using. And it, it's, it also doesn't mean that just because one measure uh, correlates well with generalization that we should be optimizing for it. Because when you, you add it in the loss function, you change, you completely change the the loss surface. So it's gonna, uh, it's not gonna be the same optimization process, but still it's a good direction, but you could use these measures to know how well your network are gonna generalize uh, early on. And then you, you can come up with some algorithm or some heuristics to try and fix that. So the, the measures that were better at correlating with generalization were sharpness based, so sharpness is the sensitivity of the loss over the tra entire training set to perturbations in model parameters and optimization based ones, which are like basically the gradient noise and the speed of optimization. So these are uh, sharpness based measures are more difficult to calculate, but optimization based are very easy to calculate, especially when you have uh, access to, to how gradients are being calculated. And they are both very good predictors of generalization. And I think this, this, this was a massive work. This is by, I think, the Google team. And it, it lays the groundwork for a lot of uh, future work which can be done in improving generalization. So it, it's could, very interesting. I've, go ahead. Yeah, could you give a quick description of what these two optimization-based measures yeah, are? Gradient, yeah, gradient noise is, uh, is the variance. You know how uh, the variance of the gradient between uh, batches or between epochs, uh, how much the gradient is, uh, is uh, okay. oscillating. And speed of optimization is how, how fast you're, you're moving towards your, your local minimum, you could say that. Uh -huh. so, so these are both measures you can take uh, while you're optimizing, right? And sharpness-based, you, you can 
you can even take like a static snapshot and they're like uh, PAC Bayesian bones, uh, but they are a little bit more difficult to calculate because you have to do a little perturbation and see how it, how it changes. So, yeah. Sharpness are these things also you can actually incorporate into the training, like the uh, gradient noise thing? Is that something you can actually try to lower the noise in the gradient somehow? Yeah, so that's the second point. So the, the goal of the paper is just to measure correlation of, of these uh, measures okay. with generalization. So, and it, it's the groundwork for other stuff, which is like, how, how can I use this to improve my training, right? It's not necessarily that if I just add it like to the loss function, like we do with uh, L2 norm, it's going to improve. It may, maybe it won't. Maybe it just change the loss surface in a way that it's just going to make it worse. But we can try and use in other ways. We can use it to evaluate models as well. So there are a bunch of work that can be done, you know, like based on this finding. So, uh, go yeah, I was just going to ask, I imagine that for the gradient noise one, um, to, to bounce off a super nice question. I imagine there's like an optimal range. I don't know if you remember if they mentioned anything like that. Like sort of like a like you know not too much and not and not too little. Is that no, do you remember? I don't remember they mentioning because uh, they they actually just measure correlation, right? They didn't measure you know like what what is it going to improve? They just measure if it correlates well with uh, uh, with generalization or not, and it does correlate well. Uh, you say I it don't does, know if they, though, like... they. Go ahead. Uh, I know, I guess it's like the correlation well, like, but did they, was it like, okay, like a lot of gradient noise correlated with good generalization or a small amount of gradient noise? Like how did oh, they, okay. uh, like, did they I quantify? Know. I have okay. probably yes, but uh, I don't know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've assumed that small gradient noise means a better generalization, but I might be wrong. But I think that's a fair assumption, let's see. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. These are a little bit more on the machine learning side. No um, need to apologize. But I clear it's like a deep learning theory. Uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. So the second one is actually going to support the first one. So this is a, is a tool. It's called a backpack. And it's a, it sits on top of PyTorch. And the whole idea is that it allows you to compute additional quantities, which are a byproduct of the backward pass. So all the all all the, the frameworks do these days is they they calculate the backward path, but they make it very hard to calculate actual measures. You have to you you can do it yourself, but it's not going to be efficient. So what these guys did, they did this package and they did it in an efficient way, and it's very easy to use as well. So if you want like the variance of the the gradient, for example, you can just this is how you use it. And so this package. Let me see what they had. So they, what they have right now, it's uh, individual gradients of the mini batch, uh, estimates of the variance uh, or the second moment. And they also have approximates of second order information, like uh, here, the, the Fisher matrix and um, yeah. So a few stuff, it can be very useful. For example, you usually use this approximates of the second order in, in continual learning. So the, and diagonal of the, the Hessian. And you could use the variance, for example, like we said in the, the previous slide, you could use the variance to estimate generalization and do something about it. So this is more like a, a tooling thing that it can be useful to us if we go down that road. Yeah, this could be very useful for us. And yeah, it's also from a big research team. I don't remember on top of my head, maybe Google, probably Google, let me see. If it's PyTorch, it's probably Facebook. <laughs> But it's not, it's not Facebook. That's, uh, it's oh, somewhat, okay. 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 But it's not Facebook. Okay, and this third one is actually, it was quite interesting. Uh, there is a, a finding here, which uh, kind of contradictory to what we think. So what they show here is that the early phase of training neural networks, it's crucial for final performance. And they show that there is a break even point. So if you use a very large learning rate, or if you use versus using a small learning rate, you're going to go in different directions in the loss surface. And what's going to change is that if you go in one direction, you're going to uh, SGD is going to implicitly regularize your network. While while you go in the other direction, uh, it, it, you're going to go to a a bad bad loss surface. You could say that. 
So what they're showing here, so uh, here is the spectral, I think it's the spectral norm of the Hessian, which is shown here. So if you take the red direction, that's like learning rate 0 0.1, you're gonna go to this direction where the spectral norm of the Hessian is slower. If you take a small learning rate, you're gonna go to the left, right? So here are two uh, different examples. And so the, the contradictory finding is that if you just increase your bet size, for example, right? So you're actually reducing your effective learning rate you get a larger variance of the grade. So you'd expect that if you increase the batch size, you get the smaller variance of the gradient. Hello? Didn't. And what they show is that key winners is, is very effective at that. And so one one simple adversary attack is you use you generate uh, adversary examples um, using gradients that you get through back propagation. And one simple defense is that you, you obfuscate the gradient somehow. And then to counter that, you could use what it's called backward path differentiable approximation, which is you find an approximation like g of x of f of x, you find like a different function, which is differentiable. So you get around the ob obfuscated gradient thing. And k winners lets you count hey, Lucas, the attack. Look, yeah. Lucas, I have a question. When we talk about the adversarial attacks, they, they, they put them in two classifications, right? One where you know the internals of the network and one you don't. I forget the terms for those. Um, is this black which box the, and black box. yeah? Which one is we talking about here? Is this assuming that we do that the uh, the attacker knows the, this or or not? Yeah, no. This is a white box. Yeah, you you have access to the network. You have access to that. Yeah. It, it, just as a general question: Is that considered uh, an important problem these days? Given that you can easily obscure the internals of a network, or, or is it is it considered still a significant problem? Well, it, it is it is important problem because um, you can I mean the networks everyone is using it's almost the same they're training the same data set so it's not it's not hard to replicate uh, a work at all right so there is no such thing as a true black box attack unless you're using like a very very widely different network training on like some strange so data just set again that, off topic here but wouldn't it be possible to just train your network a little differently? uh maybe in a different order or using slightly different data set or something like that and, and would that then make it a black box well it wouldn't make a black box per se it would make it harder um but but still um but st still you can um it, there are different classes of problems right the black box and the white box which you're saying is that is, is the white box relevant i think it still is because somehow you can get closer to it even if you don't get all the full way you could still easily get the model which is really close to it then it just becomes a white box i think okay so, right, I, thank you. I, I don't know it's not my area of expertise but uh, I, I was just i was just curious and, and some of these understand. networks are very very hard to train and very time consuming like this nlp ones and so you know very few people will be able to retrain it but a lot of people might use a common set of networks that's widely available yeah in yeah. that case most you know, people just, you're just gonna download from the same place right because <laughs> yeah. it, it um, might take you a month or two months with 100 gpus to train a BERT model or you know a big nlp model and you just don't uh, have the resources all right well thanks i was just curious so so the idea between the k winners they call is that it's an undifferentiable function and that could hardly be approximated by smooth functions and they show here the loss surface, right? Uh, here, the E epsilon is just small perturbations and how the loss surface changes. And they, sh they show that k winners at Hall has this very uh, weird loss surface. And this discontinuity in, in the k winners at Hall network, they can prevent graded based search of adversary examples. And at the same time, it doesn't hurt training, right? That's, that's the claim in the paper. 
And they show that the robustness of these networks, they outperform uh, other traditional networks under uh, white box attacks. Uh, I thought this was a very interesting addition to the work we've already done on, on robustness. We, we mainly use white noise, but we thought about it for server attacks a lot. And this paper actually goes, goes ahead and shows it and also shows it uh, theoretically. So there's all the, the map is there. Okay, any more questions on that? So I think we talk a little bit about this paper and slide, just thought it was useful. The lost surface thing is thought provoking and it's also scary, the fact that like our lost surface looks something like this. Uh, yeah it just scares me from a theoretical angle that we're trying to optimize this so apparently it works but it's scary <laughs> you mean the fact that it's so wonky and crazy all over the place yeah you know? we're trying to descend the gradient yeah, there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I can say they were also surprised in the paper you know like if you read the paper they, they're also surprised that you can still train those things so there, there is some... isn't isn't this it go back to this idea that uh i first heard from Sarah gangley which is like it looks like there might be a lot of uh, local minimum there, but in high dimensional spaces, there really aren't. And therefore, it, it looks as long as you want, but there's always going to be a, a gradient that will take you where you want to go. Is, is yeah, that I, I, yeah, I think it look, uh, potentially, it could look much better in high dimensions than that. Yeah, that was, a, that, was that sort of surprising insight, which I think other people have talked about now, too, is that, that it, there's always a, it's always a saddle in high dimensions, and you'll always be able, you'll never get stuck. Maybe, but at the same time, to the extent that you're right, I could also prove that I'm going to be able to do adversarial attacks on that network. Yeah, okay. I'm just saying, you said it was scary to look at this, like, how, how is it going to work? And I'm just thinking, oh, but that was maybe why. I think maybe we can even do like a, maybe a journal club on that one day. Might be useful. Okay. So uh, this next paper, we actually did a journal club on it last October. Uh, at, at the time it was archive and then open review. Now it was an eye clear. And I included here because it's something I, I think we can actually use, even uh, in the current dynamic sparsity models we, we have. So what they do here is uh, they have this dynamic sparse model, which is uh, like magnitude based pruning. It's very similar to the one uh, uh, Ching did, you know, Ching from Sierra River we talk about. Uh, but he adds this extra extra thing here is that he keeps true network, right? He he keeps the, the, the prune weights, the mask, and the regular weights. And what he does at every step, at every epoch, he computes the mask based on the actual weights. And then he computes the gradients based on the prune uh, network and updates just the weight based on the prune network. So the next time he, he prunes, he's going to prune on the full weight. So if there is uh, any weights that has like a large change and then they, they're going to be included back in the mask. So he always keeps a copy of the full weights and they can go back and forth. They can be removed from the mask or be included in the mask. All right, so the gradients are always calculated only based on the prune mask, but the updates are done to the full weights and the mask is always calculated on the full weights. So this is a technique that could be included in any dynamic sparsity work we do. Uh, it would be additive to it. And they actually showed really good results. So they showed improvements over other techniques. For example, he used the same technique that Chin used, but using this, uh, this two, like keeping a copy of the regular weights and he can get improvement over that. So, so, so what, what, what does the hysteresis look like for that? I mean, how uh, compared to them kind of going out uh, being removed in the next pass, uh, how much re uh, retention actually goes on when uh, they use this scheme? What is the word you use? What Hysteresis. Is I don't know what that means, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, hysteresis is basically saying uh, you potentially, uh, if, if the system was highly reactive, it would immediately flip, but hysteresis means you hang on to the previous values for some period of time uh, before it actually uh, switches over. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a good question, uh, definitely. I'd like to know, but uh, I don't know. And I don't know if they did this kind of analysis in the paper. I don't remember that, but uh, it would be good to see. All right. So uh, maybe we can even incorporate this in Regal. I don't know, Michael, and you can uh, look at it later. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about while you were talking to uh, about it. 
Um, I'm not, I think it should be uh, uh, like orthogonal to, to rig L, but I um, just want to be sure about that. Well, maybe we could talk be. about it offline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. So how much? 11 o'clock. Okay. So next one, but uh, maybe something we can also do. So there is this paper from 2019, it's called SNP. I don't know if we discussed. That's the, the idea is that you can do this pruning prior to training. So you can adjust your network in such a way, your, your sparse weights in such a way that you maximize your signal propagation, right? There's also like a bunch of theory from 2017, 18, showing that you know that's what patch norm is doing. But the idea here is that you have a prune network, a compressed neural network, and before you even train, you can just adjust it in a way that you're gonna uh, make the signal propagate as, as best as possible. So it's gonna be easier to train. Uh, so what this work does in addition to that, so SNP is something that's been out there we can use. Uh, so the idea here is that you could, uh, wait. Just trying to remember that paper. Okay, so what he's doing here is that for all layers, uh, he's trying to minimize. So here's the Frobenius norm, and here the C is the mask, W is the weight. So there's an inner product minus the the Frobenius norm of this, and the idea is that you make a you try to minimize this in order to improve, yeah, improve the, your topology and make it more trainable. I, I, I had this on my head in Monday, but I actually forgot to do this. But what this paper is pointing to is that there is future work where he wants to incorporate this into the training itself. So the idea is that every step when you're using uh, sparse networks or proof networks, you could at the same time be trying to improve your signal propagation because as you prune it, you're you're gonna make it worse, right? You're gonna make you're gonna break this dynamic isometry. Uh, even if you ensure that initialization, as you prune, you're gonna remove some weights, you're gonna add others, you're gonna break this. And you could keep trying to restore signal propagation at every epoch. So this is the idea he's pointing to. It's not where this paper what this paper did yet. He what he did is just did this at initialization but he includes there as future work and next step as uh, to use this uh, during training itself. So the reason I included this here is uh, because of it's something we can do, right? We can use some sort of, we can do this analysis at initialization. And even if we're dynamically pruning, we can make sure that when we start training, you already have the best network we could have in the perspective of signal propagation. And then at some steps, uh, some epochs, we could recheck these and we could, adjust our weight somehow, our connection somehow, as to ensure that we still have a network with, in which the signal propagation uh, works well. Could I ask uh, how he's defining signal propagation? Is it basically from layer to layer or end to end? Uh, so it's from layer to layer. So this minimization here, it's for uh, each layer. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, I thought they do consider so, uh, end to end though. Like I, cool. like I thought they sort of, uh, like I think they end up picking out some term that would be layer to layer, but I think they do derive it considering the end to end. Oh, I yeah. read, okay. Read I, I didn't know that. Maybe I, I didn't read it. I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking if, it, if you, you, you basically help the signal propagation between two layers, but it, for whatever reasons you prune things so that it gets blocked on the next layer. So it seemed like there would be some disconnect there unless you had some overall guidance as to where the salient paths are through the whole network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that case, you do have to consider end to end, but uh, I didn't, maybe I didn't walk through the full derivation to then. And uh, like Michelangelo said, they're just compounding these things and I'm doing it end to end. I, I'm not sure at all. Because I didn't went that deep into this paper, it's like last minute edition. There is a, actually another paper here that I didn't include that does same thing we're doing with magnet pruning, but it's looking at the impacts in the next layer as well, and the next like few layers. And it, it's saying like, if, if I remove this weight, it's, it's gonna have an impact on the next layers and, and it's adjusting based on that. Uh, I may, 
I may send it to just Slack later. It's not there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the last two ones I have, it's on the lottery ticket. So lottery ticket came from iClear. And this year they had two additions to it that I thought were interesting to mention. They actually had a bunch of papers based on the lottery ticket. So this one, it's called uh, early bird tickets. And the whole idea here, so the lottery ticket, you train the full network and then you prune, and then you retrain the full network and then you prune and then you keep doing that. So the scheme here is that you don't have to train it all the way before you do the pruning, right? So, so the, the idea is that uh, at some point, you're just gonna find a ticket and that ticket's not gonna change much, even if you keep training, so you can just stop there. And it's a, it's a very simple technique actually, is that they, they apply the pruning at uh, each step. So they calculate the mask at each step and then they keep it in a queue and they, they calculate the, the mask distance between this current network and the last network you calculated. And if after a few steps that mask didn't change a lot, then you just return the ticket. That means it's not gonna change a lot even if you keep on training. So it's a simple idea, but just by doing that, they could replicate the results of the lottery ticket using six to 10% of, of the calculation they use in the original paper with the simple idea. And they also showed that this works even under low cost training schemes. So if you use uh, low precision, precision training, for example, just eight bits training, which are even faster, you can still find the same mask. So you can make it even faster. So it, it, it's very empirical work, but they got good results. And the next one is by the same authors, actually, uh, Frank and Carbon plus uh, uh, Rando, who is the first author. And what they did, they, they extended the idea of the lottery tickets. The lottery ticket says you could rewind the ways to their original values. And what they investigated here is they try rewinding the weights to intermediate values as well. They showed that it's better, you don't have to rewind it all the way, you can rewind it just uh, a little bit. So they introduced this notion of you know not resetting the weights, but just rewinding a little bit. And then they also tested just rewinding the learning rate, set up the weights. So you just go back in your learning rate schedule like a few steps. And they showed in the end that if you do, so the orange one's learning rate rewinding and the blue one's weight rewinding, so if you just rewind the learning rate, it's enough. So you don't even have to rewind the weights. Hey, and Lucas, they compare it to- Lucas, I'm lost on this one a bit. So uh, just the basic idea, why would you rewind? I mean, that sounds like you're just undoing the latest learning. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so the lottery ticket's a kind of strange paper. <laughs> okay, so, so it, this, it, this assumes I know what the lottery ticket method is. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so the, so the, met, so, uh, the method works like this. You train the full network and then you prune, and then you rewind the weights all the way to the beginning, and then you train again. So you're gonna train again. I see, so you like rewind this. and then train again. Got it. Yeah, and you keep but doing- But so you only train the smaller network. And the, yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. Non-pruned yeah. weights. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the extension here is that first they show that you don't have to rewind all the way, and then they show that you don't have to rewind the weights. You only need to rewind the learning rate. So the, in the you original only technique- to, You only have to learn, rewind the learning rate? Is that what you said? The learning rate, yes. Because in the original uh -huh. pruning technique, go, go ahead. So when you say you only need to rewind the learning rate, that means you randomly initialize the weights? No, you keep the same weights. And you rewind the learning rate. And then so you, you return. Turn a little bit, rewind the learning rate, and then continue training. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Which is different from the fine tuning. So the, the one, the worst one they're comparing is fine tuning because what they did in pruning before is that after you pruned, you kept training, but you kept training with smaller learning rates. I mean, the idea is that you just fine tune the network. You already had a good network, but you made some changes and then you fine tune. But they show so here is that you, you increase the learning rate again uh, and go yeah. back down. Yeah, essentially is that. Does it and, show that? And the, you, Sorry, does it show that you need effectively less number of epics in the retraining uh, when you just rewind the learning rate as opposed to just relying the weights? Like I presume that that would be the case. Like let's say before if you rewound the weights, maybe it would take like 100 epics to get back to the original accuracy. But if you rerun the learning rate, does it take less epics? That, uh, that's a good question. I just assume so, but I'm not sure. Okay. You're saying that there must be a point to it, right? Why else they will do that? <laughs> so well, like I mean, reducing number of results itself, but hopefully it would also be computationally more efficient. 
Uh, I'm not sure, Michelangelo. Uh, maybe. Do you know if they also um, go through? Okay, I guess this is going to be the same question. I guess I'm just like wondering about their. But I, I, I actually don't think so. So if you look at the pruning algorithm here, they, they train for the original training time. So they train to completion, prune 20% lowest magnitude weights, retrain using learning rate rewinding for original training time. And they just keep doing this until you get to the sparse T1. But Maybe. you do get you do get better accuracy, right? You, you don't have less epoch, but you have better accuracy. Oh, yeah, true. I'd be interested to see if like there was some combination of the previous approach and, and this approach. Like if somehow you can keep track of like when the mass don't change that much and then just rewind your learning rate and just continue. Yeah, I mean the early bird and this one, right? You, you could probably combine yeah. because these are two different research groups and they release the papers at the same time, but mm -hmm. you could definitely combine both, yeah. All right. So yeah, I thought I had to mention the lottery ticket just because, you know, Subtitles doesn't agree, it was the best paper last year, right? <laughs> but, uh, they had a lot of issues, but it, it also brought some new perspective on the pruning uh, approach, I think. Uh, I had cool random stuff, which, yeah, I thought I didn't have time for it, and I was right. Uh, some, so just talk very quickly about it. So there are some papers on uh, using deep learning for mathematics, and especially I think the one I like, the deep learning for symbolic mathematics, they were using it for, what is it again? Let me see if I can remember. Yeah, they're using for symbolic integration and differential equations. So usually what the, the approach they tried in the past was for arithmetics, like simple arithmetics. And now they were doing uh, like more advanced stuff. So it was really good. Uh, they had this bold paper called Quentin Algorithms for Deep Convolution Neural Networks, uh, where they showed a possible approach that could be used. Uh, I say this with care because we know that you know there is no uh, algorithm right now that we know of that would work better in, in quantum computers than regular uh, architecture architectures. But they they show they show a step towards it, and uh, it was interesting to see that someone is working on the problem. And yeah, and there's some other papers I won't go there. So yeah, this, this was this was it. I hope it was useful. I tried to select a few papers that I thought you guys would like. Yeah, it's so just, this is great. It was good. So, just remind me how many talks overall? You said it was a lot, but I'm just get a sense for that. Uh, they had. Oh, well, you said they had 1,336 speakers. Fourteen hundred. Wow. In in your slide here, lower left. Yeah, I don't think they had fourteen hundred papers. That's just thirteen hundred of mine. Maybe they added the number of authors per paper. Uh, I, I'd guess like 300, 400 papers. That's my guess. That's still a huge number. Still a huge number. Yes. It yeah. just would be so hard to know what to look at. You know. And it's one, this is one like, of the smallest. This is one of the smallest of the big conferences. <laughs> you know, NeurIPS and ICML are way bigger, and CVPR. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I know, like, it's, like, it's interesting how you say. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. When you're in a conference and you're physically there, you're sort of forced to keep going at it. Um, but on the other hand, I find when there's so much data and you don't know how to sort through it a more productive strategy is like the way I, I read papers. You just, you know, you, you can scan abstracts and figures on many, many papers quickly until you find something that resonates with you. And then it, it just, it just your search strategy for finding useful information is, is, is so complicated when you have so many different ideas out there. It's, uh, I'm, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. <laughs> I'm just lamenting how difficult it is to find relevant information, <laughs> the information that's really going to help you sometimes. I think another another factor that uh, is uh, when you go to a conference, you like you put it on your calendar. You are out of the office. You are mentally en engaged in that conference. No matter yeah. what search process you're using, having that blocked off time where you really are mentally there is yeah. also valuable. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's sort of like okay, I'm dedicating 100% of my time versus the time I'm spending might be more fruitful in an offline search. Uh, but there's a balance between those two. I, I agree with that. So, and sometimes you sit through a presentation and you just, you don't think it's gonna have any relevance at all. 
And then all of a sudden, you know, sort of the end of it's like, holy crap, you know, look at that. That was a great idea. I do. I'm glad I heard that. I, it's just interesting how difficult it is. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about, um, um, I, I'm just going through. So the Subutai sent out that paper uh, this last week or this weekend or something about the, the layer six paper. Um, remember that Subutai? Yeah, um, yeah. And it was like a layer six anatomy. And I was going through that paper and there was like dozens and dozens of references on layer six, and it was like my head swimming. It was like, oh my God, these are all new references, they're all new papers, so many different things. And it's like, it just makes, sometimes it's just overwhelming and you just, you have to sort of, sort of give up in some sense at, at the moment. So I don't know where to begin here. I have to come back another day. Um, it's just an interesting problem we have. There's so much data, both on the neuroscience side and on the machine learning side. It's difficult to figure out the, the big pieces sometimes. Anyway, that was a good summary. Thank you. Uh, I feel yeah, I think there's a, a third component there is that I used to run, I used to run a uh, half marathons. And when I was training for it, like I was training every day, I could run like max five miles, six miles. And I was just exhausted because I was training by myself. But when I was at the marathon, uh, you know, I could just keep running after I finished, I could just run another one. Just because you're there, you know, like that big crowd around you, you know, like people cheering and people there with you, like running with you. And you don't feel the pain, you don't feel the suffering. But if you're running alone, after five miles, it's just done. So I think that it's that effect as well. Like you're really tired, but you know, there's so many, so much people, so many people going around. So while you, thing. so you're saying while you're at the conference, it's like you're running in a crowd, and, and therefore you just have more energy and keep going. Yeah, exactly. Like you feel, oh, all these people are yeah. doing the same thing. I have to do it, and you just keep going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just find the strength. I, I yeah, was that's the biggest question I have for uh, you know these online things. You know, can they reproduce the social aspects of it? And you know, all the different ways. You know, you know I find going to these conferences that the, the talks that I have with in people, those are as much as valuable as listening to the papers themselves. And you know, can they really effectively reproduce these kind of social and community? You know, in-person communication aspects of it. Well, I thought I thought you said earlier they had like separate uh, chat sessions for each each um, uh, poster. Is that right? So that's, had, I think yeah. that's what Neuromatch is doing. I don't know if I cleared. Oh, I see. So I that seemed like it might work in that regard. You know, that yeah, you, yeah. you could just have a Zoom call and just sit there and chat with the person. I don't yeah, know. that could be better than a real poster session. Yeah, yeah. could be. Yeah, they, they had that, but I don't think you still replicate, you know, like the, the fact of being in a crowd. So I, I, I hope they keep all this infrastructure they did for the online thing. That's really cool with the physical conference. So you can have both. That would be mm. perfect for me. Mm. An AR conference. AR, AR <laughs> conference. Mm. Yeah. Well, no free food and co coffee mugs and things like that. <laughs> Imaginary coffee mugs. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, All right. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas. This is great. Thanks. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah. All right. So we're done. Yep.